Good day to all of you in Soccer We Trust YouTube fam. We hope that you're doing well, just like us, because look at these handsome faces of ours. We're always doing well, and we're doing well because we have an absolute legend joining us today. He's a former pro, a coach, a scout, a pundit, Thomas Rongen, who has truly seen it all for the game that's developed in this country during his time. So hit like and subscribe to show your appreciation if you haven't already, and let's get after it. Yes! What is up, everybody? And welcome to Charlie Davis's Limo Driver's favorite podcast in soccer. We trust. I'm Jimmy Cream Cheese Conrad, alongside Charlie Chuck Wagon Davies, who makes his triumphant return, and Hollywood Heath Pierce, who both were in attendance for the MLS All Star Game in Minneapolis. So I look forward to getting their thoughts on that experience overall. But before we go anywhere, I have to mention that our show has been announced as the finalist for the best sports podcast category now only 10, 10 sports podcasts remain and we're one of them which is incredible so for everyone that nominated us we thank you it truly means a lot Woo! We're, gonna need, we're gonna need your help is uh, it, some, some of you I feel will like we're like, getting nominated all the time we are it's mm. just like we can't even we can't Crazy. even stop the nominations and uh we need your help because some of you will be selected at random to vote again so check your inboxes because you'll be asked to cast a final ballot and we want to add another trophy in our cabinet so let's get after it all right what would uh Charlie? I'll actually come to you first. Let's go. What would what would meaning what would it what would it mean to you to win this podcast award? I mean, I would be flexing all over. I mean, the flexes would be all over the place. All over the place. We'd have to get like yeah. I feel like we should get championship T-shirts where we have big cartoon heads and stuff, and we can give them out. Like that's our new merch line if we win this. I feel like blazers. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like like a, like a Hall of Fame blazer. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what color? Rock, what color? Rock them all over the place. Uh, Charlie's Char Charlie's thinking through the lens of like where he spends his time, country clubs, things like that. <laughs> You're not getting in with certain things. Like he's not going to get in uh, got with him. a hat. He can't get in with like embroidered shorts or something. But, like, oh, got have no, the no, no, no. on the blazer in the back, like in soccer we trust. Mm, I, like I like that. And then I like, like that. cream well, cheese yeah, on, cream on cheese. the side. Cream yeah. cheese on yeah. the sleeve. Yeah. Captain, that's Captain Cream Cheese on the <laughs> yeah. side. Captain, you know? cream, cheese. Captain <laughs> cream Cheese. Hollywood. We got a little Captain Armband right here. Uh, Captain yeah. Cream Cheese Armband. Wow, I like that. I like yeah. your ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's pretty yeah. good. That's pretty yeah. good. And Heath, uh, what color would that blazer be? I don't think I heard. What were you uh, thinking? Man, I don't know. That's a really good question. I guess red, uh, white, and blue makes sense, yeah. right? In soccer, we trust. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's let's okay. go with that. All right. All right. So now we have a very special guest who's joining us for the rest of the show. Not just the first half of the show, but for the rest of the show. So it's time for the tail of the tape, everybody. Are you ready for this? Born in Amsterdam. Before making his move. To the U.S. at the age of 23, where he embarked on a journey of playing for 15 years for every acronym available in the U.S. soccer landscape. I'm talking the NASL, the MISL, the USL, the ASL, who all share an L in their names, by the way, which probably means that's why they don't exist anymore. Before he moved on to a successful coaching career at all levels of the game, including being named as the first MLS coach of the year in 1996, the first year of the league's existence, He's coached four MLS teams in his life, was an academy director at another. He's been a scout for the U.S. soccer forever. Coached our U-20 national team from the 2001-2005 and again from 2006 to 2011. And now he's our colleague at CBS Sports and a longtime friend with the best bow ties in the game. It's Tommy! Great, great to see you as always. My neighbors think I'm absolutely batshit crazy, and you know what? I'm totally <laughs> okay with that. So, TR, you coached in three MLS All-Star games, and the All-Star game happened last night between MLS and Liga MA Keys. MLS won two to one. What did it mean for you as a coach to be a part of that event, which is, uh, you know, one of the bigger events for MLS during their calendar season? Yeah, during those years, Jim, they picked the leading coach of the leading team. So it meant I was leading three times out of, what, 10 years in MLS, which is a pretty decent record. So pretty that good. Was That's amazing. I was proud of. And I think the first game in the inaugural year was special. 70,000 people in Giant Stadium, East versus West, Brazil versus the rest of the world. That was a, a real spectacle. But the East-West uh, thing became really something that players didn't look forward to. So the addition of club teams, the addition of the Mexican national team the last two years has, has changed the dimensions. It made actually these games somewhat bearable to watch and with the level in, of intensity due to you know, the rivalry between both countries and add to that next year's Super League or World Cup style play between Mexican teams and US teams. I thought uh, 
the last two years looked like more real games than the early years where nobody wanted to get injured. Yeah, but with, <laughs> but but in saying that, wouldn't you like to see, let's say for next year, it co- comes back to DC, the All Star game? Yeah, you got to be a part of it. Obviously, you, you coach DC United. Wouldn't you? Don't you think there's enough quality at this point to go back to East and West, and that if with the right mentality, that this game could speak for itself? Well, no doubt, Charlie. If we're talking about the first three, it was through 99, 96, so four years, um, we had 12 teams. So it pretty much was, um, you know, half of DC United and half of the Tampa Bay Mutiny will be on the, on the West. <laughs> right. And then Jimmy's team will be the... the <laughs> Not the, that all. That was the part of that. Jimmy, was, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy didn't make a team till he was 27, Tom, so he wouldn't have been an all-star. I, I didn't, I didn't blossom until I was 27, 28. <laughs> but in terms of quality now, Charlie, with all the teams and, and somewhat of a rivalry between uh, East and East and West, and we didn't have an East and West in terms of standings. We just said, okay, anybody uh, West of the, uh, what is it, dixon Macy line is West, and anybody you know, to the other side of uh, Kansas City is East. Uh, but no, there's some merits to that. Again, I think uh, going forward. That's fair. That's fair. And it's the it's the Mason Dixie. You had it a little bit backwards. Oh, there, Mason you were Dixie. Close. There you yeah. go. He fears yeah, you know. Yeah. But uh, I want to. We're gonna yeah, let you. We're, we're gonna let you slide. Why, why do you have to? Why do you have to call him out? Yeah, because what, somebody I, listen. Because I've been on the internet long enough to know that if I don't address it now, somebody else will address it, and it can uh, <laughs> turn into a, uh, a a wildfire. Now, Thomas, you're one of the few people that's coached a across generations, across levels within the U.S. landscape. And we hear from everybody about the quality now versus the quality then, the quality of the American player now versus then. You've coached at the youth national team level. You've been involved at all, all national team levels. Is, are you seeing something different? Are you seeing another generation that, that, that we should be buying into the hype of the quality of the player that's coming up? Or is it still pretty relative and it's yet to be, yet to be seen what level of player we're capable of producing in the short term? No, I think I think there's merit to both. Uh, uh, quite frankly, we've got quite a large group of young players that went clearly too early that really haven't haven't done well. Some that are returning. There's a handful that, that have excelled, uh, no no doubt about it. Will continue to excel as well. I, I think from let's say the start of MLS in 1996 till now, we've made tremendous strides. And I I use the term called tips, which is I X related technique insight personality and speed and in all of those we're we're not optimal technically yet but i think we're a lot better you know the quality of technical players is a lot better in terms of game awareness and decision makers making uh, we're, we're a lot further as well both domestically and, and and internationally we see more players with courage initiative the p stands for personality and then obviously the s of tips stands for speed both physical where we've always excelled and continue to excel and 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 mental speed as well and that goes back to you know making the right decisions under duress under real pressure in not a lot of time and and, and space and i think that's where we've made a lot of progress quite frankly and will continue to do so uh, i think the under 20s are, are a great example uh, not just how they play but how they ran away with it uh, and if you look at the olympics which is what one is 201 birth year, the other one is 203. You can feel that, you know, I think the Olympic squats are only 18, but you can feel, you know, um, <laughs> the, the list goes on and on of, of, of players, obviously, that, 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 that aren't there. Uh, Tolkien, uh, Conrad Villafuente, uh, Tillman, Cole Bassett, uh, Ben Bender, which is here, by the way, Tanner Tesman, and the list goes on and on of players that can play by the way, since 16 years that has been in the Olympics. And we all know what 2000, in particular for Landon, Bees, Bobby Convey did in 208. That was the last time we went. That was the group with uh, with Josie, with Stuart Holden, with Brad Guzan, with uh, yeah. a few let's, guys from let's my... Just, let's just stop it there. As well. <laughs> so we're going to continue to gain experiences at the highest level thank God, due to the Olympics as well, which is much needed. Thomas, I'm curious. You talked about some of the under-20s. You had some of the most successful under-20s in in the World Cup. The 2003 team that made it to the corners. I also think of that U-20 team with 
Robbie Rogers, Danny Zatella, Freddie Adu in Canada. Mm. I think about the 2003s, by the way, Charlie, because Thomas cut me uh, from that. Ooh. So uh, I think about that a lot. But, uh, but, but we'll uh, get back to that in a little but, bit. But, uh, you just were good players? enough, Heath. Just accept it. I just wanted to tell you that. Johnny, he took Johnny Bornstein over you? No, no, no. No. Was, no. Was, uh, <laughs> no, that's Bob's that was, boy. That was, that, was, that, was, that was Bob, yeah. Um, how many of those players do you think would be in Europe if, if they were playing today? When, I, when you're comparing the young player now and, and the young player back then, because it seems to me that th those players were top at, at that time. And if, if they had the same respect that the world has for young Americans, I, I feel like more of those players would be playing in, in that, That's always been an interesting question. You can arguably say that Bruce Arena's team in 202 in Japan and Korea should have gone to the semifinals. Let's be real honest. The, yes. the, the handball by, by Germany. And that was a team with Tony Sane playing as a right back. I think it was Eddie Pope, the young Lennon Donovan, and some other guys that didn't know any better. Their first World Cup, they were just excited. You could say that starting 11 is as good as our current starting 11. Might even have more in terms of, you know, the right mentality. In, in, in saying that, um, I think this, this current group... Um, is clearly one of the most talented we've we've seen in the youngest team in the next World Cup as well, by by far. Um, and within that, you have guys that play for Chelsea, Juventus, and you guys all know the list, obviously, that you, you probably have debated uh, here as well. Um, who, are, who, are the some those players, players, who are some of those players and, on those teams in, in your what, mind? What is great? Heath. And, and you as examples. Heath, I had to cut, and it was a tough one, and Heath know, knows that. Uh, but I thought I was doing the right thing with Anthony Wallace, and, and I had another option there, Heath, I can't remember. That was the 203 team, correct? No, Anthony Wallace, I think, was 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 after that. You had, we had... Uh, oh, Jordan Zach, Harvey. We had Jordan Harvey, Jordan Whitbread. Harvey. We had um, Shafiq Simo coming through. Correct. Um, before his accident, oh, he, was, he was knows pretty... all the names, Thomas. Don't you yeah, worry. Yeah. He's got him on a, he's got him on a bulletin board. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, and, and there was initially a fight uh, between three to make two, basically, because you could be too deep in every position almost if you you know bring 24, 26 players. But but the wild card became Zach Whitbread. I found Zach Whitbread with an American passport playing at a very high level at Liverpool and was the best left fullback that came very late in the equation, and he became. The victim of that. If he goes, for instance, uh, with 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 that team, it might be a, a different story for Heath Pierce because that's all, it. Only takes one other big event where you can be seen by scouts overseas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Charlie, which would have started for my two or five uh, team in the World Cup, but I became the head coach of Chivas and Ziggy Schmidt took over. Mm -hmm. Bless his heart, didn't deem Charlie to be the right player mentally, whatever it might be. And I saw in Charlie a very talented player at that time with so much more upside, just like I saw with Clint Dempsey in 203 that didn't play a lot of minutes for the under-20s as well. I recommended to uh, the New England Revolution to take a flyer on him. It was back then Project 40. So crazy how those pathways go. And then both of you guys actually go abroad initially, both Heath and, and, and Charlie, and take totally different routes than... Jimmy Conrad, that went to school for four years, <laughs> basically said, hey, fuck I wasn't good you. enough to be on the U20. <laughs> he went like this to San Diego, went to UCLA, really big time, you know. <laughs> um, I was a walk-on, but yeah, keep going, uh, Thomas, keep going. And then no, no. Jimmy starts his career in the U.S. and eventually also goes abroad, and all you guys come back again. And at one point in time, you guys might have played together maybe in a Gold Cup. Yeah. Keith and Charlie yeah. were. And the, the Copa America. Yeah, in the 209 uh, South, A South Africa, where you guys did so well with Bob yep. Bradley. Uh, yes. You guys were teammates. So crazy paths. You all have Nuts. caps. So, so Thomas, he, talk he to us about... Even, he didn't make the 20s, but he might have more caps combined than you, Jimmy, and... and, and uh, and Charles, okay, so Thomas, correct. you didn't need to bring up that. I don't know why that needed to be. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, want, hey, Thomas, yeah. we're good now. I just all I needed to know. Just give me, give me one thing to be proud of, and I'm, I'm, I'm there now. He, he so. made it up. He made it but, up. So, so, so Thomas, th there's a rumor that you were one of the first people to identify Charlie as having this, this talent. And, and when I think about your acronym of tips that's got brought over from IAX, I assume you just saw Charlie's personality. 
when did you really think he had the T and the I and the S to actually be a, a top, top player? It was a <laughs> shit field. Either my stepson, Chris, or my stepdaughter, also rest in peace, Nicole, were in a tournament just outside of Boston, like fucking hundreds of fields and, and cow, <laughs> cow fields. And I'm walking around, and how does he not catch your eye? He goes, woof. It's like I go, did somebody just blow, blow by me? Yeah, <laughs> Charlie Davis. Okay. So that was the first thing. I looked at technical, looked at a few things. I, I, I was intrigued by him, actually. I took him to quite a few camps till Siggy came and mm -hmm. said, that's not my type of player. But I mean, I remember the Mill Cup. And by the way, this is a Charlie Davis Mill Cup jersey. Wow. Of, of, Jeez. Of, of, wow. Of, of, of 204, where he should have scored 20 and he scored three, but in number nine. <laughs> that's why he gave uh, me after the point. game. So sorry, dude. Yeah, yeah, fair point. How many breakaways... That I, I had so many breakaways. <laughs> I could not. I, it was just one of those mental breaks. I would I would run through a line and just burst through a, on a breakaway. The ball would stick to my feet. The, it Two, was like six, it was seven times crosses a game, galore. Times a game. <laughs> you know, but actually, I'm glad I didn't play for you, Thomas, because you got no stories about me. Uh, that you I threw it over. Was just feeding him with his left peg, you know, and the Irish guys would go, what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so good. No, All fun. right. So, so Thomas, talk to us about... Actually, actually Jimmy, ahead, I, I, I wanted to shift this um, uh, to, to dual nationals. It's a big, it's a big mm -hmm. part of the conversation. It was a huge thing uh, when we talk about dual nationals under Jurgen Klinsmann because we saw a larger influx of the German-American and the dual national that we think about now is, or, or historically is, is the Mexican-American player or or perhaps a CONCACAF player that has, has, has options. What was that process like for you in terms of technology then, of you finding players, scouting players, the dual nationals? You had to go much further to, to, to find them versus, versus now, where it seems like the U.S. actually is able to kind of go punch yeah. for punch with the dual national and recruit them outside of the ones who maybe weren't going to make their other national team as the story and therefore could play for the U.S. as an opportunity to go for a, a youth or, or a senior World Cup. Okay, so this is the story. 208... We have a camp in Mexico to play in a tournament. And I'm bringing for the first, no, no, sorry. <laughs> Whoa, I'm always blue this one. So we're in the same hotel as a team called Staba. So I go to the coach, I go, hey, can we play a little bit? So halfway through the first half, it was pretty chill. I go, dude, the number 10. He goes, yeah, it's got a US passport. I go, what? Yeah, Mikel Discarut. This is Mikel Discarut. I go, okay, this kid can play. I, I, I kind of like him, you know? So I'm in Mexico. In Guadalajara, uh, playing against Starbuck, and there's a guy who has an American passport. So I said to, <laughs> to Sunil Galati, I said, listen, if, if I could find a guy from Sweden or Denmark that has a U.S. passport playing in Mexico against me, there's got to be others out there. Ding, ding. I never really thought till um, Mookie. What was Mookie's name again, Keith? Um, I don't Brilliant know. Brilliant player. Lanky midfield played with your 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 uh, at Bradenton Brian Argues. Oh yeah, yeah. In two oh nine, in the early two oh nine, he gets signed by uh, her to Berlin. So he calls me a month in. He's a funny cat from uh, from Miami. He goes, coach, coach. Wait, yeah, that's me. Mookie. That's yeah. I remember seeing Mookie at a, a random. I didn't know that that was Brian Argues. That I, yeah. everybody was talking about when I was leaving Bradenton. This kid. I uh, in some tournament in Florida, Correct. and everybody's calling him Mookie. I did not know that that was him. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Miami guy goes, Coach, hey, bro, bro, listen to this. There's bro. four cats, man, in the locker room. They're all black. You know, they all got U.S. passports. I go, what are you talking about, Brian? He goes, yeah, 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 seriously. I just spoke to them. They all showed me their passports. So there's this John Brooks, um, Walter Boyd, Jerome Kiesewetter, and uh, Morales. I'll play yeah. on U19 Hertha Berlin. So I go, they must be playing. And, and obviously I talked to the coach. So I brought him, I brought those guys over first. And then the list became a long list. And you can discuss right, wrong, or indifferent. And he, I used internet surges, uh, even big soccer, because these guys are like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I found within the three or four years I was there about 500 plus players abroad. Now, from those 500, wow. we probably had ended up 14 guys that made respective 
under 15, 17, 20. I didn't look at age. And I just would say to a respective coach, I think this is a guy you should, should look at. And we went, weren't we good enough, Americans? Was it needed at that time to bring in some German-Americans? I'm still not so sure. It, it clearly created a, not a very good environment. And, and, and I'm glad that Greg has stayed away from that and gone with, you know, mostly true American players, with the exception of Sosinho Dest. And Yunus Musa, still... basically. But yeah, that was an incredible process, actually. And, and you, know, you have a lot of army bases in, in throughout the world. So they marry German, Swiss, whatever it might be, and the children become dual citizens. So that's something I learned in 208. But when you, when you talk about those dual nationals, I think back then, most of them, had Germany called them up, they'd be playing for Germany if they had the choice, right? The quality of, of that dual national. But now, or Serginho Dest, the Netherlands wanted him to play. They wanted Serginho to pick Holland over the U.S. Yet Serginho chose the U.S. That never happened before. And then Yunus Musa is another one who was courted by three different countries. He chooses the U.S. What What's changed for these players to now say, you know what? I see the project. I see the potential for this U.S. Women's National Team, and I want to represent the, the country. I think we've done a much better job from all the top down, that obviously starts with Greg Berhalter, of taking a real deep dive look into these players. I, I watch them play. I watch them train for three days and I send to respective teams. Yes, I went to their families. I made a point of that. Try to look them in the eyes and see how serious they were about representing the U.S. jersey that should be very special. But I'm, we all, along the line, made some mistakes. And there were certainly quite a few guys in the love room that didn't care that much about the U.S. than we thought they initially did. Uh, whereas this group is, is different, more committed, has better options elsewhere, potentially. Back then, it was I had a better chance to make the World Cup on the U.S. team than on the German national team. So, Thomas, I, I'm kind of curious because as a scout, there's going to be hits and there's going to be misses. And I know one that's attached to your name from a miss standpoint is Nevin Subotic, uh, who was part of Borussia Dortmund. And he was part of our residency camp at the U-17s. You left him off the U-20 roster. And I think he took that very personally and then ultimately played for Serbia's national team. 36 caps, two goals, played for Borussia Dortmund for almost 200 games, center back six foot four, had all, you know, ticked all the boxes, but maybe he wasn't ready when you, when you had him with the U twenties and, and that's fine. That's part of the process as well. How do you manage when you have some misses or when some players kind of figure out a way to kind of give you the middle finger later on that? Why didn't you pick me then? Like Heath Pierce, you know? Uh, and, 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 and also this falls into Ziggy Schmidt, not taking Charlie Davies when it was clear that Charlie did have something that you saw and you would have brought him. I mean, how do you manage that? Cause I think that's a difficult part of the game that, Maybe not everybody takes into consideration when you're a coach or a scout. Yeah, you, you certainly do, uh, Jimmy. And, and, and to me, what was important, and listen, it's subjective. Mm -hmm. I've made mistakes, no, no doubt about it. I'll look back, even, even he is, I think, a good example, you know, that really carved out a pretty darn good career, still ends up playing for our, our senior team. I could have probably done better there uh, and would have the other 20 experience, which is really qualifying in the World Cup about eight meaningful games maybe could that have helped in in, in his development no doubt well, we had that we had the delay as well in that world cup remember it was postponed yeah. um for six months i had to take a semester off of school that was a really unique experience being out of school but training between camps just sitting in bradenton trying to get on with uh with mls teams when they came through town and things like that it was a really unique unique period uh, i remember that yeah it certainly was it was a very unique uh, period during that time but, but you know going back to jimmy that's a tough question, Jim. Again, I think in, in Nevin's case, I could have done better. I called him out in front of the group. I thought he was ready for it because he always portrayed himself to be a, a very tough guy. Uh, but at 18, a lot of guys do. Um, I was still learning as, as, as a coach as well in that age group uh, as being a former pro and, and being on the uh, you know professional uh, teams and not necessarily there. So... Um, you know, and I felt he 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 massaged that a little bit to his liking. Sure. Because I think he really wanted Germany, quite frankly, and that ha didn't happen, and Serbia became a good option. But uh, I, I, looking back, I should have handled that a little bit better. I should have taken him apart and not not lay into him. And 
you know, told him basically he, he sucked, which I can do sometimes in a strong way. Uh, <laughs> if you don't, but, shit. but you you've seen some players react in a different way, right? It, where it's worked, and you yeah. and you you've motivated them to to be better. In most Are, cases, Charlie, yeah. and I think he knows that also. Till he said, I'm I'm pretty democratic. I'm, I'm a player's coach. I can be hard at times and a little crazy, uh, but I think. <laughs> My method of coaching, the way we want to play, is more positive and, and, and a good engaging and learning environment than than on the on the other end. But yeah, in Nevin's case, I, I I could have done better, and who the hell knows? We would have had a pretty darn good center back, which he proved, unfortunately, due to his injuries, didn't really fulfill his potential completely. But had a good run with Dortmund and and, and Serbia, played in the World Cup, no doubt. Is, is there any player, one player, whether it's Jonathan Gonzalez, who, who you spent a lot of time with uh, on the recruitment side, or, or, or Nevin, or even Vidad uh, Ibisevic, uh, that could have at some point played for the U.S. that you think could have was a big miss or a loss um, looking back that could have changed the dynamic? We were talking about this last week of, of dual nationals that selected Mexico over the last couple of years, whether that's Efrain Alvarez or, or Araujo. I didn't really feel like we're missing anybody. We didn't take a big, a big loss on anybody who's who's turned out to be a huge star for Mexico or at the club level. Is there anyone that that you think of either now or or then that that was a loss? I, I can't really think of anybody at the top of my head. Um, we had some losses, in, including Gonzalez when I was there, obviously, and I was part of that discussion that didn't go well and 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 forced him a little bit into uh, choosing Mexico. In retrospect. He hasn't really played any games, so in my opinion, it was not a big loss. But for the federation at that time, it it, it was since we lost a few already. So uh, that that goes beyond me. But I can't think of anybody. Um, I just can't of anybody right now that we maybe missed and that later just came on our our radar that we all went like, really, you know, from Montana or uh, New Mexico. I, I don't think. Uh, Heath, no, I don't think so. In terms of, of players you've coached at the youth level, who do you think had the biggest potential but just didn't live up to it? Is it, is it clearly Freddie Adu or are there some other players that you thought, man, back then I really thought you'd be playing in Champions yeah. League and in and, and the top clubs? And, and Thomas, Thomas, before you answer that, give, give some context to somebody like Clint Dempsey as well, who I was in camp with when you brought him in, local kid in Houston, and sort of that trajectory to kind of paint that picture a little bit for us that, that that may have missed. He was one that was a hit on his last sort of like last opportunity there. Correct. No, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, you go through a tedious process. And back then, I mean, my 203 team had three pros on it, predominantly college. 205 Charlie, probably half and half. And then all of a sudden you look at this current under 20 team, they're not only pros, but most of them are in Europe. Um, you know, which is which is pretty remarkable how far we've, we've, we've come. Um, Two best center backs I've ever coached at 16, 17, 18, three. John, Jonathan Brooks, number one. Chet Marshall, number two. Nevin Sabotic, number three. Best holding midfielder, probably Michael Brantley. Best eight, Danny Satella. Danny Satella was unbelievable. He was nasty. It's but so, so, yeah, so good. What a shame, you know, that he, could, that he couldn't get his private life uh, sorted out. Not a guy wasted standard talent, Santino Ferranta. Mm. So that could have been an absolute big timer uh, and didn't really get where I think he should have gone when he was 16, 17, 18, when he played with Eddie Johnson up front, by the way, and he scored like 8,000 goals against Guatemala, <laughs> against Guatemala you know? Yeah. You come to the under-20 level and go, what do you mean I'm not starting? I just scored 6,000 goals against uh, El Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> okay, relax, chill. <laughs> So Thomas, I, I'm kind of curious just about what you've seen throughout the game for for your numbers of years as a player, coach, scout, uh, pundit now as well. Like, what's been the biggest sea change for you in terms of how the game's evolved from maybe when you were playing with the LA Aztecs in the NASL when you first got started to what you're seeing now domestically at all levels? It doesn't have to be isolated to MLS. It can be the robustness of USL that's now creating a couple of different divisions. You got uh, all these other acronyms that are are going as well with Nisa and and um, and you got the women's side of the game too, which is obviously blown up and and I think really helps continue to to create a lot of energy and momentum and positivity around the game. Yeah, all of the above. But the okay. biggest to me was, and I'll give you an example. Um, 
1980, we're playing away against the Cosmos, 70,000 people. LA Aztecs, Johan Cruyff against Beckenbauer and all the big boys of Warner Brothers and Communication the Cosmos in Giant Stadium. It's 1-1. It's one, one. I'm marking Beckenbauer and I'm a nobody in a corner. He speaks fluent German. Most Dutch speak German. So he goes to Johan Cruyff, he goes, hey, nicht das Spiel, uh, nach uh, 90 Minuten. Eh? So basically he said, if we don't go to overtime, we don't go to overtime, we got to go downtown Studio 54. So I'm going, whatever. Yeah, I've never heard of it, but it was all. Cruyff plays a through ball. Beckenbauer stumbles a little bit. Whoop, 2-1. And Cruyff goes to me, hurry up, let's go to the shower. So I get in the limo, and I'm looking up and sitting next to Mick Jagger. So it's Mick, Mick Jagger, Kevin Keegan, the Stones, Beckenbauer, Cruyff, and myself were taken off to uh, to Manhattan. And there's a pile of, well, whatever. You know, it's really it's an intriguing, uh, <laughs> limo. It's an intriguing <laughs> limo ride. So we go into a, a garage, basically. But it's an elevator. And we're taking off. And this limo is like 20 feet long. So we're going, it's a studio. And Mick Jerry goes to me, what's your favorite song? I go, dude, Sympathy for the Devil. He goes, okay, I'll play it for you. These, these cats are playing for me. But Cruyff, although a, a smoker, was not didn't like any other chemicals that were around us at that time. So he says, we got to go. So now I'm in a limo with Beckenbauer and Cruyff and myself. And I'm walking in and Liza Minnelli get pushed out of the way. So Thomas Rowling can walk up to Studio 54. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty cool. So to make a long story short, the investment of foreign players now, younger, more committed than back then when they were at the end of their careers, great names. Don't get me wrong. Some great games, and Jimmy, you know that. Um, I'm not. I didn't play in the NHL. Jimmy, what are you no, I know. Yeah, <laughs> he couldn't make old, any man. teams. Then he had to wait for MLS. He wouldn't make an AM in AM yeah. team. Yeah, Jimmy played in the 1950 World Cup. I think. <laughs> that earthquake was George Best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, gee. Exactly. Uh, earthquakes. Uh, <laughs> hey, Jimmy, Thomas grew up a fan of you, you know? That's <laughs> <laughs> I, so now, all of a sudden, I see real... And back then, we had some good guys, too. I mean, Valderrama was pretty darn good. But most, uh, 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 you know, most foreigners back, sorry, back in, in those days, didn't really care much about... Uh, I, I played with Ricardo Villa, first away trip. So this is Fort Lauderdale Strikers. Ricardo Villa. Argentine national team, World Cup champ, 78. Of course, the winner at Wembley for uh, Tottenham. The Falcon Wars. It's all going crazy. At the cream cheese time. is barking him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was he, there. He was, it's funny you brought him up. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, Jimmy touched on you being a pundit. I, I was always curious, Thomas, because we... Uh, we never whoa, talked whoa, about whoa. it. Tell me the story. So, yeah, yeah, Charlie, get out of his story, man. I'm gonna rush his story. I didn't know. I didn't know he was still going. Wait, he's still going. longer than Heath's so, stories. So. <laughs> falls in love with Pac-Man, so he's playing Pac-Man. So I go, Ricky, we got a team meeting at three o'clock. He goes, I'm breaking my record, my man. I'm gonna stay here. So okay, team meeting. He's not there. So ten minutes later, he comes in, sits in the back, lights up a cigarette. So the coach and I have to make a decision. What am I doing? So he goes, You're not starting today. And he's laying in the bed. He goes, you really think I give a shit? You're older, <laughs> by the way. Give me apartment for free. Okay? <laughs> Pay me all my money up front. I have a ranch in Argentina. I have a house in London. You really think Ricky Villa gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that was pretty talk, much it. Talk about the power back then, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But also not caring about the American game. Right. Also true. I, I, I was curious when you... you Jimmy talked about you being a pundit, and I've never spoke to you about this, but when you called the game, my first comeback game after the car accident in D.C. against the Columbus crew, what what was that like for you? What was that experience? What did you expect from me that 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 game, that, that year? Yeah, it was crazy because, I mean, you know, I thought we had a pretty tight relationship, Charlie. It was short and sweet. And then, you know, we, everybody goes their own ways and, 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 and things like that. But there was always a liking to coaches fall in love with players, certain players, and vice versa, you know. And you get your, your special guys. And that's why people still question, why is this guy starting? Well, because Greg Berhalter believes in this guy and, and trusts him in right. the story, you know. And he knows him better. And he's good in the locker room, blah, blah, blah. So... The anticipation was obviously incredible because of the, the storyline and the storyline for you to be able to walk, not walk away, to be able to walk again and be able to play, you know, up to a certain level. And that was the big question mark, obviously. 
um, yeah, that was pretty pretty wild, pretty special, and pretty crazy in terms of an analysis. Charlie, I, I kept an open mind, you know. I mean, uh, I knew what you went through, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you never reached that level. Physically. Yeah, no, no, yeah, correct, no, no, never. And that were certain times where I think I swallowed a little bit, you know, because uh, that must have been real hard for you to deal with, uh, not being able to get back to the level where you were and just play another 50 times for your country, you know, yeah. and that, that, that was taken away from you, obviously, you learned from that, but that was my takeaway, that first game, it was very emotional, as you know. All right, we're going to take our first and only break of In Soccer We Trust, but when we return, we got more with the legend, Thomas Rongen. So don't go anywhere. We found your daughter. She's alive. Mister? It's mommy. Four years is a long time. Welcome home. I think something's going on with Esther. She seemed different. Since she got back, there's constant lying. There's outbursts of anger. First kill rated R streaming August 19th on Paramount Plus. Welcome back to In Soccer We Trust, everybody. I'm Jimmy Conrad alongside Charlie Davies and Heath Pierce and our very special guest, Thomas Rongen. But before we continue to get into our conversation, and we have a ton of questions for Thomas because he's seen it all, especially here in the States. I have to let everybody know that Paramount Plus is the only place to stream every minute of every Serie A match. And you can quickly and easily sign up for your very own account right now with a free one month trial, not just a week or a day one month by going to paramountplus.com forward slash Italy. Just click the try it free button and use promo code Italy for instant access to the best Italian club Calcio, also known as soccer available across all of your devices. Visit paramountplus.com forward slash Italy and start streaming one of the most wide open leagues in Europe today. Go make that happen. All right, Thomas Rongen question first from me. We're going to move from Serie A to La Liga because we've got some, Dual nationals that are playing over there, or Luca de la, well, Yunus Musa, I suppose, that one, Luca de la Torre, another U.S. men's national team player. And I know you cover this league pretty extensively and have for, for many years as a pundit. What are you expecting from La Liga this season? Because it feels like a two horse race, as always, with all due respect to my Atletico Madrid, who I support. And I don't know if they've got it in them this time. Maybe they do, but last year was a bit of a dumpster fire. The defense was in shambles. But what are you thinking about La Liga and then, and then the emergence of Yunus Musa? Because it looks like they're finally starting to put him more centrally than out wide. Yeah, and, and that's brilliant for his development. Gattuso has pretty much come out and said, I want you to play centrally. And, and let's be real honest, only the big-time players play centrally, in particular you know, for a team like Valencia uh, that won't fight for first or second. It's a two-horse race. And right now, after the way Real <laughs> Madrid dismantled uh, Frankfurt, I would bet against them to do win La Liga and, and it. And the Champions League again, you know, I mean, amazing. Um, but Musa is, is is key for them, and Musa is key uh, for our U.S. men's national team. I, I, if I had to pick my eleven, he would be. Ooh, let's one of hear those, it. Let's hear your those, eleven, Thomas. Don't go. No, no, you can't tease us like that. And not give it to us. What's your eleven? Yeah, no. So let's say you're the coach. All right, Thomas, Zach, Stefan, or Matt Turner. Who starts in goal for you? Matt Turner. Matt Turner. Now, center back, Zimmerman, Long, Richards, Cameron Carter-Vickers. Who's your pair? Well, he, I think he's going to say John Brooks if I had to jump in just because of his experience Stop with John it. Brooks. I'm just John saying. Brooks, John okay, Brooks just saw He just went, show no, me the money. Is show me the yeah, that's it's true. That's true. It that is, John is John Brooks just signs. He just yeah. signed. I'll tell you right no, now. It, it is done. But in my opinion, the two best center backs are John Brooks – and Zimmerman, and the natural lefty in the left zone. If you want to play out of the back, I'm telling you, letting a ball run across your body versus taking a touch, and then that could kill you mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. on the highest level. In saying that, I understand the high line, but I'm telling you, I've worked with Brooks uh, on a few camps. He's not slower than, than Aaron Long, who's probably going to start right now next to him. Although, again, if I had to pick another one, I would pick Chris Richards after John Brooks in that position, but I I always want a left-footed player in that left zone in the back. I don't yep. care where I need to find them. Fun, fun fact, I played at the left zone as a right-footer. and No, uh, I know you did. Yeah. 
and you're but but it's not it's but to your point you have to take that extra you have to take that extra touch to hit the switch to the right side and that does make it more predictable for the other team before brooks a lefty jimmy bocanegra tim ream bocanegra beasler beasler sorry yeah 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 i'm telling you the way tim ream played the other day yeah, he was all right. <laughs> Seriously, he was Seriously all right. against Liverpool, against Liverpool with, with, with some juice. He Jesus, quite Jesus, well, actually. Jesus Ferrer, Ricardo Pepe, Jordan P. Folk, Haji Wright. Who's your nine? No, 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 because I got to fit in Musa, Pulisic, Aronson. McKinney. Uh, Hart. Ar- Aronson starts for you then, Thomas. Timmy Weah. I put Timo away at the nine. That's what I put him at. G, the nine. And Gio Reyna. Oh, wow. So oh, I will play. You're just going straight midfielders. Aronson is my false nine, baby. Oh, okay. wow. Okay. I let guys from deep get behind him when he drops in the midfield. I mean, in terms of the, if you want to press. he's a, He'd be a great first line of pressure. Great, great press. Saying that, he likes to run at people as well, you mm-hmm. know. So, But in order, and Charlie knows it, he threw, I always try to get my best 11 on the field. And that's that that's like I Bruce Arena, too. It. Bruce Arena, it's kind of the same thing. I want my best 11 players on the field. Correct, then, exactly. Then we'll figure it out. And then we'll figure it out. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. And, and sometimes we figured it out, and a lot of times we didn't figure it out. Like, <laughs> in, like in 2018, we didn't figure it out at all. But um, where were we? We were talking about... Uh, so who's okay. your who's your, who's your yeah, midfield, yeah. then? Or your yeah. number nine? You didn't, oh, I guess you said you'd have uh, Aaron Tanner. Aaron Tanner, but... Who's yeah. So Musa, McKinney, and Adams in the middle then, or no? Adam McKinney or Adams has to come off for if you're going to play. If you're going to put Gio Reyna, Adams, yeah. McKinney, yep. Gio Reyna, yep. Pulisic, yep. Timothy Weah, Aronson. So no Musa. No, Musa's out. Okay, well. Mc- so you know what? Yeah. We're going to win with Thomas because we're going to have 13 <laughs> players. <now>. <laughs> 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 That's a you, you can't, you hey, can't this, take Musa hey, off. At hey, this point. Thomas, this comforts me knowing that I was I was a last cut because I know you were having this conversation where they were like, "Well, you got to cut Heath," and you're like, "Oh well, yeah, uh, no." No, I, like, know, uh, I know, I know deep down, I know deep down, you're like, "Yeah, he's out, no problem." <laughs> <laughs> quick, like, quick no, Heath at nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, well, somebody will play him out out of my eleven then during these next three months. Injuries he, occur. He, he we just took a break. Who got getting started again? So who the hell knows? But yeah, if if there is one player who's on the fringes, who who do you think could, could come back into the picture that has, has kind of been out of the picture? Well, Tim Ream, I think, is one of the names that you just mentioned. Yes, that that will be that will be that we won. It's too early right now to say, but the next three months there will be somebody that's been part of the program, but not as intensively and at every qualifying game. That probably will end up making that roster. The rosters are what 26? 26. So you get some, you get quite some some leeway, you know. Um, Robinson is your starter on the left, obviously. The center back, we're all having our opinions so, so, about next, wait, next to Zimmerman. So Death, Thomas, what's what's Death's Death's best spot for you? I mean, you've obviously watched him. He's Ajax, he's Dutch, you know, you guys have a similar backgrounds, uh, you know, and, and how you came up and how you were uh, developed. What 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 do you think is his best spot? Do you think it's as a right back? Because defending, I think at times can be a little suspect, even though I think he's improving. But it's as a wing back, but we don't necessarily play with wing backs. We don't have Correct. that three center backs and the two wing backs. What, what what do you think would be his best spot ideally? That would be his best spot if he if he would have played for the Netherlands out of Louis van Gaal's three five two. Now he would have mm-hmm. played on the right side. So I'm I'm only kidding because there's so many the place for Inter Milan that's a little bit better still than him. <laughs> I, I've never really rated him, to be real honest with wow. you. Wow. Um, first and foremost, defensively, he's a liability, I think. It could cost you a game. Um, he has to fight for his starting position. Thank God they're not very – they've bought everywhere else, but not necessarily the right back. So, it's again, you know, uh, Roberto, um, you know, whoever got – Raujo can maybe fit in there. Yeah. So, you could potentially start starter for that team and – with the way they play and always on behalf of the opponent, it's, it's a little bit of a different story because the starting points can be higher. He doesn't defend that, that much, quite frankly. When he has to defend, it's just a straight screw it back in transition. Right. When we play against equal teams that will possess the ball a little bit as well and say it's 50-50, they're going to force us backwards. And now you've got to make decisions in 
2v1, 1v1 situations. And every time I look at him, I'm going, he's not really aware of his surroundings that mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Is there so, anybody better out there? Yeah, yeah, would you would you play Yedlin? Because Yedlin right now, I think, is playing arguably the best of his career. He seems super happy. He's in tune with the, with himself. I think his service has gotten better. I think he, yeah. he can change his pace uh, uh, more often. Would you consider Brother, were you hanging Yed out with him last night or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're throwing no, a lot. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, I, watch, <laughs> I watch him play. You know, I, I think Inter-Miami, he, he's done really well uh, over the past couple of months with yeah. Inter-Miami. So if you're – he's played in England. He's played against Harry Kane. He's played with Harry Kane. Would you consider playing him against England, or would you play a desk regardless of who you're playing against because he gives you so much on the attacking side of the ball? Uh, well, I think that Greg will look at opponents, but what I've seen of him, he's pretty much in going out and say, this is the way I want to play first and foremost and let the other team adapt, uh, which is I kind of like, actually. Uh, but you got to be adaptive in a World Cup, in a one-off game, and you might have to make a change tactically. Let's say it's Foden or Graylish on that side. Uh, that will probably, although Dest has got great physical speed, he doesn't have great mental speed. So I don't care how fast you are over five yards, those guys potentially off the dribble could, could take him on. Whereas Yetlin, and I call every Inter-Miami game on radio, has been pretty darn good on both sides of the ball. And, and you're right, improved in... Heath, what did I tell you, bro? And, and listen, he, he, well, he'd be the only that's player that's with World Cup experience as well with DeAndre right. Yedlin. And I think that does have some value too, Thomas. Yeah, no no doubt. Jimmy, you know that. You're, every group had, had their four or five elder statesmen. And we're talking about elder statesmen, still quite young, you know, uh, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. an experienced guy that's great in a locker room, even if he doesn't start, uh, which is, you know, that probably will still be the starter. You need guys like that, no doubt not about would, it. Would, would you start Christian Pulisic regardless? Let's say he doesn't play that much with Chelsea. Yeah, that's a hypothetical. I, I, yeah. I still say um, it, it would all depend on um, – I, I still feel an informed Aronson an inf on the left, an informed Timmy Weah versus a not informed or a not have played Pulisic. I would sit Pulisic. Right. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, I mean, we've seen we've seen him be yeah. a super sub before when he came off the bench against Mexico at home and he scored the vital goal. And I mean, I guess I kind of feel the same way about Aronson, that if he came off the bench and had that type of energy and that type of desire yeah. to want to get the ball and run it, guys, when they're tired, it makes such yeah. a big difference. So I, I think you can make the same argument for Pulisic or Aronson coming off the bench. But if 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 Aronson continues to play and and you talk about press yeah, per, per 90, you, you have to you, yeah, have, you have to, have to start. you have to. Put him on the field. He has yeah. to start. If he's killing it in the Premier League week in and week out, got to play. Yeah, he, he has to play. Well, the high line is also designed around players like then having to commit to that. And at times they didn't press well through qualifying because it just takes one player now to not arrive earlier on time for that mm -hmm. press to be Correct. broken. Thomas, my my thing for you is you you talked about Sergio Dest and not necessarily rating him as a complete player, which I fully agree with. Uh, goes basically one season at Ajax and then becomes the hype and then goes to Barcelona. Ajax knows that they, they need to move him on and, and, and capitalize on that value. He's now in a situation, and this is also Pulisic, where we talk about, yeah, but if Des doesn't play at Barcelona, where can he go and actually be successful? Because he does need to be in a situation where you're dictating play and, in, in, you know, starting high on the field and in, in, in positive positions as opposed to being a little bit more of a two-way defender. For someone like him or someone like Pulisic, where could they go next if not in situations like this that they can continue to de develop or, or, or be challenged? He, he's actually been in, in, in four years of incredible environments with two teams, Ajax and Barcelona, that play very similar. Uh, technical, every player is technical on behalf of the opponent. Possession 65 to 70 every game as well. I think he struggled even more if he goes to a mid-level Dutch team or a mid-level English team uh, because then the, so so much more will come at him that he normally doesn't see very often that spaces in midfield on both sides of the ball where he normally doesn't end up it's either bumming forward or not and staying high and work in transition all of a sudden he's going to make some real real decisions and, and follow a, a tactical plan that might be not suited so He's probably with the best club that he can be right now. If you look at Savi, obviously, he made what 21 appearances, uh, and that was 17 starts. 
you know, that's, that's half the season he, he didn't play. Um, but if he plays predominantly, yeah, he can. I don't think he can make a case for anybody else that should start at right back, uh, including, uh, including Joe Skelly or, or whoever. Reggie Cannon. I'm curious, Thomas, you're the manager heading into this World Cup. What does it look like from a tactics standpoint as you play against Wales in that first game, you play against England in the second game and Iran in the third game? What would be your expectations? Is it to finish second in the group? Is is that the success, just getting it out? Or would you do you think you could upset England with a, a real tactical game plan of being solid defensively and, and just looking to counter and, and you get that one golden chance, you finish and you win one nil? Yeah, that's a great question. And we got we got to look at, at at the group and then potentially a matchup against the Netherlands, maybe in a round of sixteen mm-hmm. if it works out that way. Although it wouldn't surprise me if the US as we did when we tied or, or Landon scored late, Jimmy, uh, when we beat England. What year was that in, in, in Brazil, was it? Uh uh to win the group. Mm-hmm. That was uh, South Africa, 2010. South Africa, 2010. Sorry, 2010. Exactly. It wouldn't surprise me that we can win the group. You know, at any given day, I think this group has the talent. They've proven it a little bit against Uruguay, and, and they're facing different competition, no doubt about it. But each and every team that went to the World Cup got out of group play, with the exception of the 98 team. Most of the times passed the round of 16 as well. So... You know, could we make a run? I know that the long-term vision is to reach the semis. You know, that's that's actually in paper to reach the semis in 2026 with a mature team around 26, 27, 28. And that makes sense. In saying that, I get this funny feeling that, that this team that's young, daring, a little naive, which is a good thing, hasn't been to the World Cup yet. Uh, so we'll embrace it uh, till two years later. They're on the front of Sports Illustrated, and all of a sudden the pressure is mounting and, and mm-hmm, they're mm-hmm. wilting under it. It wouldn't surprise me if this team actually can make a run, quite frankly, and, and mm-hmm. has the ability and, and the players to do it, and the coach as well. I, I'm, I'm a big Burhalter fan, actually. Yeah, it kind of has 2002 vibes, potentially, where it's all set up for us to yeah. have a good run when people maybe aren't expecting it as much. We know that we have a good team, but we're young, and and the expectations should be kind of tempered in that area. Now, I once had the opportunity to interview Jurgen Klinsmann, head of the 2014 World Cup, Thomas, and I asked him, uh, would you rather? And the would you rather question was, would you rather, when we're in Brazil, play extremely well in our group and really demonstrate to not only our opponents in the group, but to the whole world watching – that we are going to be really awesome really soon because that's how well we're performing. We're making better decisions. We're really, you know, getting A pluses on all your tips, that acronym that you used at the very beginning with regard to IAX. Like it's clear that we're going to get better. Or would you rather us play to our stereotypes, which is sit back and counter and try to hit them on a set piece like we're going to try to do against England, which we probably will that Charlie mentioned, and, and kind of still get stuck in that space where we're just spirit first. You know, that's what we're known for. Great spirit, good, hardworking guys, uh, physical, but but kind of yeah. lack in every mm-hmm. other area. Okay, continue. But get out of your group. Mm-hmm. And so Jurgen said that he would rather get out of the group, which I understand where he came from, from a results-oriented thing, but he'd been promising all the other stuff on the other side uh, about all this aesthetically pleasing and vertical integration and all this other jargon he was using to try to, you know, use car just, sales. Just say us. how you don't like Jurgen. Just say I, 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 it's it's, it's well documented. Him. It's well, no, no, no. I think he, <laughs> listen, I think he's a great idea guy. I think he's a great idea guy and he should have been like a general manager and pushing Sunil, then president Sunil Galati into doing different things to grow the program. And to, I love that he brought in the player pool. No problem with any of that. I just didn't really rate him as a coach. So, so, I kind of want to, to what you would rather do or what would you rather see out of this, knowing that 2026 feels like more of the destination where we can make a serious run. I, I'm a romantic, Jimmy. I'm from the Netherlands. <laughs> we've, been, we've been to three World Cups and we, we refused to win a World Cup ugly. So we rather lose. Three World Cup finals, that is. Three World Cup finals. Yeah, yeah. We've lost them all. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I rather show the world that we can play. Yeah, I'm the same. That's I, how I felt too. That means I would probably lose my job if you don't make it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're getting lost it eventually anyway. Yeah. Which, yeah. which is true, correct? Um, but yeah, that's that's yeah, I, I mean that's that's an interesting an interesting take and, and one that I found uh you know, we had Steve Trundle on recently and he talked about how it's sort of a hired to be fired and a lot of drama of, of coaching in Germany, but in the US, 
it, it, he talked about there being pressures at LAFC and things like that. But I was sort of like, oh, it's, it's, it, it's the same because teams are now starting to build a philosophy or a culture into the club of the way we're going to play, regardless of, of, of coach. Was the 2018 failure, is that something you saw happening at some point in your lifetime, Thomas, in terms of like, hey, this recipe of like outfight everyone is not built on this ground of like a style of play or a, yes, it's cultural, but it, it didn't have a lot of other elements that other national teams or other more well-established uh, leagues maybe develop their players into. Did you see that coming? And do you think that we've addressed that now for the, for the far future that we're setting ourselves up for success? Yeah, I think we have, quite frankly. Uh, I think each and every day uh, on all levels, and it includes uh, the USL highest level as well, where I look at some games and go, hey, there's some guys that can, can play. Some guys, I think it was Gonzalez, the left back uh, from, from was it Louisville that ended up uh, in either France or, or uh, Germany. I think out of CONCACAF, 28 players got transferred, majority out of MLS, one out of Canada, three out of Mexico, but quite a few out of the USL as well. So I think we found a mechanism, a vertical integration of uh, development of players driven by MLS academies. Some still uh, behind, but others doing quite well and, and investing in the game going forward that will we'll continue to pay, uh, pay uh, dividends. Um, and, 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 and I firmly believe that Greg and Ernie won us in 2026, not put the logo on, but through play for people in Bulgaria to say, that's the US men's national team. Just like we know yellow is Brazil and the blue is France and the orange is the Netherlands. We don't need to see the logo we know what that represents and right. what that means in terms of playing style, philosophy, approach. And I think we want to be a, a very good footballing country, first and foremost, based on technical players. And, uh, I'm and that, that's refreshing, actually, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and pretty cool to see that, that transformation from Jimmy talked about it. Defend, defend, get a set piece, win what, get Brian McBride up front, Joe Max Moore running off him. Uh, mm -hmm. Two big, strong center backs with some level of athleticism, and basically ten hardworking guys in a four-four-two, low pressure mode, in transition maybe catch a goal here and there, but really based on getting one set piece, one look, and, and that has changed over time. But we're, we're, we've become a pretty darn good footballing nation, I actually. I, I agree. I, I have two questions, Thomas. One, settle the debate. Landon Donovan or Clint Dempsey, who's the GOAT? Hot seat, hot seat. Mm -hmm. uh, Landon Donovan. Landon Donovan is the GOAT. I, I, any particular reason? What separates the two? Just better than Clint. Okay. <laughs> I then, love that answer. Dude. Then, oh, yeah. You asked what you asked. You got the answer, Charlie. Because he's what better you than him. You know, yeah. Which one's better? The one that I picked. Why? Because yeah. he's better. All right. <laughs> Number two. How important do you think it is when it comes to goalkeeper, goalkeepers and, and their ability to play with their feet? If Tim Howard is in his prime, and we know Tim Howard, Brad Friedel, they weren't great with their feet, would they be starting on this team? Or do you think because they don't have the ability to, to play at the certain level that Greg wants them to play, that they would not be included in this in this, in this Tim, team? Tim would have. Because, uh, Charlie, back in, go back to Casey Keller, Brad Friedel. They, they, they didn't. And, and one of the reasons was because – specific positional technical tactical training for goalkeepers back in those days had nothing to do with their feet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they could pick up balls they could play back to them first and foremost so they could just, you know that's how he wasted time played back to the keeper played back to the keeper played back to the keeper and he could eventually punt it up field or, or, or throw it so now the revolution of starting really in 74 with clockwork orange and the dutch national team where one of the our best goalkeeper in the country did not start a game because Rinus Michels, Johan Cruyff, and the Ajax Revolution wanted a footballing player because we're going to play on behalf of the opponent. So the only time they're going to catch us is in the counter. We need a guy that can play outside of his 18 yard box with his feet. Mm -hmm. Might not be able to catch the ball, but that's okay. Well, right. it, it cost us in the final because he couldn't catch two. <laughs> <laughs> but so Tim Howard would have had that kind of training to play the bodies back 
Timmy's an incredible athlete. He would have picked it up like 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 that. Now it almost seems like don't worry about the save. Make sure we can keep possession, or you can play a vertical ball and find the number six or the number eight. A little ridiculous, quite frankly. Just like I still think the center back, like Jimmy was, that's the guy, Jimmy, number nine. Okay, if he bleeds at the end of the game, good, well done. Keep a for- shutout, Jimmy. Job done. And Jimmy, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. A ten-yard pass into a guy that's better than you. Yeah, it, it, it does drive me crazy. It's not isolated to the U.S. men's national team, but when you see a goalkeeper actually have more touches on the ball for a team than their number 10, like what are we even doing with our lives if our goalkeeper is right. touching it more right. than the ball? So so last question, Thomas. We appreciate your time, and, and these stories are absolutely amazing. We want one more, though, and this is tradition here for the podcast and yes. Soccer We Trust. What's the best jersey swap that you've ever had in your career? Obviously, you played with and against some of the biggest names in the sports history but I also want to throw in there that you actually have a jacket from Prince or the artist formerly known as Prince rest in peace. So that might be thrown into the equation yeah. as well. Cause that's, that's, oh, that's flex, pretty ridiculous. Flex.com. So yeah, Which let us know. You, uh, Jimmy, well, I don't you know. You tell what? me, do you have a Jersey better than the, than you, the Prince you jacket want, or you, you want me, you want me uh, to send you Pele Jersey autographs? I would George take that Pele. in a heart. You tell George. me, I put it up on my wall right away. I have him <laughs> Muhammad Ali right behind me. I'll fight you <laughs> for it. <laughs> Best one, uh, the best one actually was again 1980. Wim Rijsbergen and Johan Nations played for the Cosmos. Two Dutchies that played in the 70. Are you speaking Dutch Michael. right now, Thomas? I don't understand what you are like. Yeah, little, little, What's hey, going on here? He, I, I thought the same thing. I said, yeah. Oh boy, and I'm uh, playing with Cruyff and Wim Janssen. So these four guys played in the 74 World Cup. So I'm going, I'm on Johan Nations' uh, jersey. So after the game, here. Thomas Rowan, 23 years old. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, oh, nice, pleasure. Can I have your jersey? And he went, uh-uh. So he kept walking. So now I'm going, okay, I'm going to the other guy. <laughs> they swapped with the other Dutch guys. But I ended up in a Georgia Kinalia jersey. Oh, amazing. Which I wore in Studio 55, dancing with uh, 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 Mary Tyler Moore. Wow. <laughs> that is, oh, that is like, that, I don't. That's a flex. I mean, you say that maybe the game's evolved and all these stuff, but I don't know if we have Wait, players how do you get that can get invited jacket? to Studio 54 anymore. Okay. Yeah, let's, how'd you get the I, Prince jacket? Right, okay, last well, story about uh, Prince. So, 1980, I'm in mean, Fort Lauderdale, play for the Strikers. Everything is good. Joe Robbie owns the Dolphins and the Strikers. Walks in one day, he goes, I'm going to move the franchise to Minnesota. I go, we're all going, where the fuck's Minnesota? <laughs> <laughs> So I end up in Minneapolis, living at Lake Hennepin. And next door are all these trucks, TV trucks. And somebody goes, oh, yeah, big show, big show. Mary Tyler Moore show. I go, OK, well, let me check it out. Well, at that time, the biggest sitcom in, in the US. So one day, I give her some tickets to the game. A few weeks later, she knocks on my door. She goes, she was 60. I was 25. She goes, you want to be my date? I go, sure. Yeah, no problem. Where are we going? She goes, I can't tell you, but we're going to see a, a phenom, almost almost like a Charlie Davis-like kind of phenom. That we're <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I walk into what? First Avenue, baby. First Avenue with about 100 other people. And here's Prince jamming. I'm going, okay, this, this cat is cool. By the way, the chick he's married to is also cool, you know? I mean, <laughs> it, was the whole, it was the whole entourage. So we go backstage, because Mary Tyler Moore is a big wig in, in Minneapolis, and introvert doesn't say much and she goes to me she goes what do you like I, go, I like his jacket takes his jacket off gives me a jacket i have a prince jacket oversized for him but fits me perfectly dude that oh wow my that is gosh. i mean where is it talking, do you have a proper you have legend it? yeah is it yeah drop your address into the into the chat let us know let us know when, you, let us, let us know when you're out of town let us know when you're when you're when you're on the road you know there's a i heard i heard best fillet there's a there's some prince uh goods in there and yeah mary tyler moore is like Kisses yeah. or whatever just, just, you were doing with text, text me your address, TR. Wow. Okay. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thomas Rogan, thank you so much for being on In Soccer We Trust. We appreciate you and all of your stories and all of your experience and all of your insight and everything that you've given to the game here in this country. And we look forward to having <laughs> you back on the show very, very soon. Thomas Rogan, everybody. There he is, man, hey, myth, and by legend. By the way, this chat is ruthless. I'm trying to keep it together, and I'm seeing – People drop it in. He looks like Thanos. Like, how, <laughs> how, how can I ask a question uh, if guys are, are people are, are typing? He looks like Thanos in, in the chat. Come oh, on. Is that man. your final thought, Charlie? Because I'm going to give you a final thought before. No, we final thought. That was amazing. That was amazing. Yeah. I, I, know, my, like that's that's U.S. soccer yeah. royalty. That it really is. Coach of the year of Major League Soccer, it's, the first coach of the year. 
three yeah. time all star yeah. coach. Like he's seen it all. He's yeah. seen it all. It's so he's much insight. Absolutely seen it all. It's and like his, a walk in encyclopedia for the game in this. Yeah, game. it's yeah. it's it's fun to have these experiences. Like he says, people go off on their own, and, the, and when you bring it back together, especially when it's visceral like this, to be able to have a conversation with somebody that I've seen I've seen Tr throughout the years. And you're passing, you know, at a bar or at a meeting or at a all star or a, a cup or whatever. And you're saying hello, you know, Studio 54 or, you know, in the back of a limo, wherever it is that you run into him. Um, Jimmy was an investor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cream cheese. Jim. Yeah. Jim Jimmy, was. Jimmy was the assistant coach of Thomas's first team in the U.S. Uh, it, it's it's fun Jim. to rekindle those stories and, and to hear those stories that kind of like come back on a journey. It's, it's pretty cool. All right, we're done. This this show's over. Right. The Hamburglar <laughs> says, uh, have, a, <laughs> done. Have, a, "Have a great night." It's all set. Uh, it's done. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching it and listening. In soccer, we trust. On behalf of producer Des, producer Alex, Charlie, Chuck Wagon, Davies, Hollywood Heat, Pierce. I'm Jimmy Cream Cheese Conrad. Say we'll see you next time. That is tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll see you then. Later. <laughs>